In the late 1970s, Van Morrison reappeared after several years on hiatus, a period during which he had gone from being one of the world's biggest stars to a memory from rock and roll's past, as music moved on in his absence. On his eventual return, Morrison was a transformed figure, teetotal and motivated, but also garrulous and confrontational. I think it's always been a problem for him. He has a God-given talent. He sings like a god, he writes like a god, you know. But Van Morrison has this tendency to be truculent for truculent's sake almost, you know. And in some ways it works for him, in other ways it works against him, you know. He was a little dour, uh, oh, you know, but that's the nature of who he, who he is. You know, I think that he was sober at that time and he had a, a Mr. Coffee set up in the studio and he pretty much kept that thing going all day long. <laughs> Over the course of the years that followed, he embarked on a journey in which he sought to find independence as an artist and explore spirituality in his music. This film is the story of that journey. I didn't expect the, uh, the spiritualism that was going to be, because I didn't really have any sense that that was going on lyrically. And when that sort of came up, it was like, oh, that's cool. You know, it's very, uh, it felt nice. There's a restlessness about Van Morrison as an artist. There's no question about that. And that, you know, I think he's over his entire career, I think, explored a lot of different sounds. Um, I think, however, in, in, in the 70s and 80s, um, he defined what I would think of as a kind of essential Van Morrison sound that is a kind of conglomerate of all of the things that he's interested in. And he kind of invented a sound, I believe. Van is a songwriter. Van told me one time, I write songs. And the reason I make records is because that's where songs come. <laughs> <laughs> and that, that sums him up. He makes records because that's the way songs come. You gonna mug me? I might gotta mug you. Is that gorgeous or what, eh? And I believe I can run a decent marathon. Thank you very much. Download Veely now. In the spring of 1974, Van Morrison was completing work on Wiedenvlies, his eighth studio album in seven years. The first decade in his career had been a roller coaster. Having burst onto the music scene as frontman of the garage rock band Them, he had left his native Northern Ireland for the bright lights of America where he had launched a solo career that had carried him from obscurity and poverty to being one of the most celebrated artists of the period. By the time we get to Veden Fleece, Van Morrison has created this body of work over six solo albums that really cover the waterfront. They set out the motifs and the the themes and the styles that are really going to in, in, inform the, the rest of his career. Um, I mean, in, in a way, he's slightly unfortunate in that he started off with a completely unique one-off piece of work in Astral Weeks. How do you follow that? Well, the answer is he follows it with a, a kind of jazz soul album in Moon Dance, and then he follows it with a very R&B-oriented album in, in his band and street choir, and then there are sort of slightly more troubadour style albums in, in St. Dominic's Preview and uh, particularly Tuplo Honey by the, which time he's living in Woodstock and uh, you know this is redolent of that whole sort of troubadour era. So he's, he's done all of these different things really that draw on so many sources. Sweet choir. It's an incredibly impressive body of work, which, as I say, really sets out the template for the rest of his career. But possibly at this point, it's also created a certain amount of 
confusion about his musical identity and what he actually is and what he stands for. Through that period also, I mean, he just really distinguished himself as a singer. The instant that you heard Van Morrison, you knew who, exactly who it was. And he had that quality of, you know, kind of like this endless improvisation, you know, this ability to um, kind of renew a song every time that he approached it. So, you know, that early phase of his career was, you know, very distinctive and he was important and influential and, you know, someone that everyone kept their eye on, the sense that, you know, a Van Morrison record was a, a great event. And I think he got involved with serious musicians while he was in America. Uh, there was even, a, at one point, I think there, there was a, supposed to have been a collaboration with Miles Davis. I don't think it ever happened, but I mean, the very fact that Miles Davis was at all interested in Van Morrison shows at what level he worked or what, what level he was respected at on musically. With Wiedenfleece, however, Morrison had hit choppy waters. On its release in late 1974, the album was met by collective indifference, with critics dismissive and sales significantly lower than Morrison had become accustomed to. He was clearly stung by the response and made disdainful remarks about the press. Although it was later reappraised as an exceptional record, Wiedenfleece brought to an end a sequence of unblemished success. Van Morrison, right about that time, was really beginning to kind of chart his own path musically and was not really connecting with any of the trends you know, that were happening during this period, including something like singer-songwriters, which you'd think you know, he might be a part of. You know, heavy metal was coming into the picture, punk rock was just beginning to come into the picture, and a, a record like Veen and Fleece, which really didn't seem, certainly not to map onto any of those trends, and also seemed like a little bit of a departure for Van Morrison, I think just left people confounded. It's hard to believe at this point, uh, but back in the early 70s, there was a sense that, you know, if you were still making music, uh, you know, when you were 30-ish, you know, there was some element of, well, what exactly are you doing? You know, you, you know, are you, you, are you too old to rock and roll? You know, that was, that was very much a feeling. And I think that was, you know, something that affected uh, the, the perception of Van Morrison at that point. You know, it's like, what does Van Morrison mean? I mean, it is a record sort of made in exile. I mean, it's, also, it's almost like Robert Browning's Home Thoughts from Abroad, you know, oh, oh, to be in Ireland now that April is there. I mean, I think a lot of the record was actually written when he was on vacation or, or staying in Ireland, but was actually at that time resident on, on, on the west coast of America. And so it's obviously present in, in things like uh, Streets of Arklow and, and Country Fair. Um, but yeah, it was, uh, it was a, a a misunderstood and a, a disregarded album at, at, at the time. Uh, I mean, as indeed Astral Weeks was too, and a little later on, um, Common One was. And it's, it's, it's almost a theme of his career that perhaps his greatest works have been the records that have been most underappreciated at the, the time of their release. Chain off the South Field. Watching them build down for the game. One shot deal don't matter. The other one's all the same. Oh, my friend, I see you. Wanted to come through. And I'll stand. As time passed and whatever the issues were and the struggles were and the battles were and the trends were at the time, you know, when you could just return to it and listen to it, you know, you were able to come to it with a lot more uh, freedom and a lot more openness. And I think those are the qualities that um, 
I think, reward your listening to that album. Following the disappointment of Wiedenfleece, Van Morrison disappeared altogether. Ensconced in his home outside San Francisco, he claimed to be exhausted and described himself as having fallen out of love with music. Although stories of recording sessions and prospective tours circulated in the press, it would be three years before another Van Morrison album. He had left the phase where he was really significantly a shifting what music was, you know, at the same time as, you know, he wasn't somebody that sought out media attention, so he didn't get it. You know, so there was an element of um, Van Morrison's disappearance was quite literally that, you know, a disappearance. No, people just stopped looking for him. You know, in the 1970s, you put out uh, a record at least once a year. So, so three years off is, is a, a, a big absence. Um, and he is troubled. I think he's, he's, he's got divorced. He's drinking a lot. And there are stories that he was attending AA at this time. And so all of that is inevitably going to impinge upon his work. But then out of that comes um, this quest, this searching for uh, answers on a, a spiritual or a religious level. And that's a manifestation of, of a, a very, very troubled soul. <laughs> Van Morrison briefly resurfaced in the winter of 1976 to make an appearance at The Last Waltz, a farewell concert for the band. Also on the bill was the New Orleans pianist Mac Rebernack, better known as Dr. John. A hugely influential jazz, R&B and blues artist, Dr. John had struck up a rapport with Morrison and had agreed to help end his exile from the music business by collaborating on a new studio album. I think Dr. John, you know, what he brought was that, you know, he's a creative guy and he brings a lot of history and soul and just, you know, being the whole New Orleans thing, he, it was, it was a, quite, a, quite a, an ordeal for, for me because, you know, I mean, I loved it. He, you know, he, he plays this great piano. You know, I could just sit around and just listen to play just in the studio and not even recording them. It was pretty nice. And he, you know, he threw, he and Van worked on a lot of ideas together out by the piano. They work up the parts and stuff. And he was there to please Van and, you know, compliment the music. I mean, he's a, he's a great supporter. He's, you know, he's your, right behind you. He, you know, he's, your, he's the, your rooting section. And he was great for everybody. You know, he really gave a lot of support to everybody. Van's done a lot of great stuff on his own, but I think he was probably saying, you know, maybe I can get a little more funk, a little more soul, a little more from Mac. Maybe this, this time in his life, it was like, this might help me, you know, a little bit more, because I had this period of not recording for a while. Sessions for what would become a period of transition took place a world away from the traditional haunts of Morrison's former life as a Bay Area hippie. Accompanied by Dr. John and the album's other musicians, he relocated to Manor Studios in the English countryside, a quiet and unhurried setting in which to reacquaint himself with the recording process. Everybody was there together. You know, it was a family kind of ordeal. And the, the, they have a great staff there. The facility was, was wonderful, you know, and I think the environment was conducive to be relaxed. We're, gonna not, we're not rushing into anything. We're going to sit down, we're going to run through the stuff and, and learn the songs and record them. And um, it was. It was a very relaxed atmosphere. I think he's particular, but he's not picky. For him, it's feel. He gets the feel. If you come in and, and the vocal feels right, and it's good expression, and you know, he's got the, the, the vibe that, that, that works, he's not going to do much to change it. That's really his thing, is, uh, like Dylan and some other artists. They just... They, they go for the feel. If it feels right, great. If there's a couple little mistakes, it's not gonna matter. You know, it's the feel and the vibe and the, the, you know, everybody's playing together and it just works. And those records aren't sterile. I mean, I felt good about the album. I mean, this is, I didn't know if we had a hit, you know, and I've gone back and listened to it. I thought, this is a really good record. I mean, there's some good stuff on that record. The, the vocals were great. I mean, Van is just like an amazing singer. He's, he's fearful when he sings. 
You know, he doesn't, it's like he doesn't care, you know, if he misses a note because he's had so much trust in how he sings. So um, I, I was blown away when I listened to it, you know, just recently too. I think a period of transition is a, a, a great album, and I'm probably in a minority in thinking that. Uh, I mean, he made it with with Mac Rabinac, Doctor John, and I think that's a brilliant combination. And uh, you know, it's 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 possibly the funkiest record in 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 his canon. Certainly, the funkiest record he'd made since parts of his band and street choir back in 1971. It's got some crack musicians on there, uh, musicians from Stevie Wonder's band, and Stevie Wonder was the hottest thing on the planet at that point of, of time. A period of transition in that uh, late 70s era is, uh, it, it is a somewhat rootless uh, van trying to uh, re-establish and re reassemble, I think, his, uh, his, his, uh, his, his uh, our, our, our artistry, really. He's actually in a period of transition. Rather than this record reflecting where he's going, it's almost like a holding record. So it's gone back to his R&B roots with the help of Dr. John, uh, while he is searching for his next direction. Van Morrison's return, however, was greeted with little fanfare. Reviews of A Period of Transition were tepid and disinterested. Music had moved on over the course of the 70s, and the album was released during the so-called Year of Punk, when the punk rock phenomenon came to dominate the music world. The sense of kind of cultural struggle that punk represented was very important. And, you know, if, if something didn't seem like it was part of that, it was very easy to just turn away from it, because, because that, that, that battle was 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 requiring so much of anybody who cared about it, and I and I think that hurt an artist like Van Morrison who didn't really care that much about it and really pretty much wanted nothing to do with it. If Van Morrison was making music like the kind of music he made with them, which was kind of rough and tumble, you know, R and B, the punks really would have looked up to that. I mean, and and the music that he made with them was an inspiration for what what punk became. And there was a kind of questioning of, of every artist who kind of came up in the 60s, you know, and, you know, they had to kind of re-earn their place. And so for someone like Van Morrison, who pretty much wasn't interested in doing that, you know, he was going to suffer for that. You know, there was a, a sense in which, you know, the, the, cult, the cultural energy was around what, what punk rock meant. While that punk, you know, everything changed with punk, really a lot of things stayed the same. Actually, you know, the big bands still maybe, you know, head for a few while, but they, they come back. So, so that looming, uh, booming kind of gargantuan industry where <clears throat> Springsteen would have uh, been uh, the obvious example, you know, he had, he had, he had burst through it. And, and these people uh, like, like Bruce Springsteen and, and what the Rolling Stones were doing, and they're building massive industries ar around uh, themselves. Um, that, that is starting to, to, to grow and, uh, and flourish. Um, the, the kind of uh, the coming of the 80s uh, icon. Van came back from hippie land almost to, to a situation which changed somewhat in England. 
Music had changed. I had hopes that what punk was going to do was going to produce another form of music, and it didn't really. It shot itself in the foot, largely because of its attitude again. Too belligerent, too offensive at times, with the very people that were going to give it the platform to be able to work from. I mentioned that once to Van Morrison. He said that that's a dead subject. I don't really like it very much. So <laughs> he wasn't greatly impressed by uh, punk rock, although he did actually like their attitude. Uh, he understood why they were angry, and he applauded uh, the way that the uh, punk rock bands took on the music press, for example. He was never happy with the way he was treated by the music press, which then, of course, had tremendous power. It could make or break an artist. And uh, somebody like Van Morrison, very sensitive and caring about his work, as he said, he worked very hard at what he does. Um, you know, he didn't uh, really sort of appreciate being criticised at every turn, whatever he did wrong or whatever he did right. So in some strange way, he related to punk rock in that sense, but if not musically. And Morrison had by now adopted an increasingly confrontational demeanour. Together with public disdain for the music press, he became openly hostile to his label, Warner Brothers, accusing them of inadequately promoting a period of transition and mismanaging his work. I think Van Morrison is quite confused at this point about his career and what he is and what he wants to be. So on one hand, you know, he's berating Warner Brothers that they're not marketing properly. Why hasn't he got a number one single or a number one album? Uh, so he's thirsting for commercial success in that way. Uh, but then at the same time, uh, you know, he sees himself as an artist who's in it for the long haul rather than, uh, you know, a piece of a, a pop commodity. So he's measuring himself against people like Ray Charles and Muddy Waters and Duke Ellington rather than against, you know, the pop stars of that time. So there is this confusion about wanting to be a star but not wanting what goes with stardom and fame and celebrity. Uh, so he develops this very sort of tetchy persona in terms of his relationship with, with, with the media. And he has paranoia about any attempt to make discovery about his personal life as he sees it, you know, his family. It can be quite innocuous questions, you know. He would regard, Van would regard, what's your favourite colour as a personal question. Frustrations over the performance of A Period of Transition were in part satisfied by the release in 1978 of a new studio album, Wavelength. Showcasing a more commercially oriented sound, Wavelength proved to be the fastest selling record of Van Morrison's career and went gold within three months of hitting the shelves. Wavelength was the Van Morrison record that a lot of people were waiting for. You know, it was much more muscular, it was much more hard hitting, it, it, it connected much more with you know, the kind of like, you know, bruising R&B, you know, that he used to do. And that was what people liked about him. Certainly what I think what his, you know, fan base, not necessarily critics, but, you know, what his fans wanted from him. So, yeah, Wavelength did very well. I mean, Van Morrison kind of played to his base. Says who thought Van Morrison may be on the way out. Certainly wasn't at that period. He was doing incredibly well. Uh, always controversial, of course, always in the news at that time. But the album itself, um, it uh, benefited in some respects from having Peter Bardens on the keyboards, who also introduced synth synthesizer 
to the sound. So he updated and modernised the sound of the album, which would appeal to you know, a new generation of fans. And uh, Bardens, of course, was an old friend from them days. He'd played with them for a while. And I think it introduced a kind of combination of nostalgia and happiness, you know, Van Morrison seeing at one with himself in that period. But out of the studio, Morrison continued to cut an antagonistic figure. High-profile managers, including the arts impresario Harvey Goldsmith and famed concert promoter Bill Graham, both parted company with the singer in exasperation. His public appearances were also often erratic, and an infamous incident came at New York's Palladium, where Van Morrison abruptly left the stage mid-performance, and an angry crowd demanded a refund of their tickets. Fans are never going to sit down with someone who's going to give them advice and that. And uh, I mean, he's an autodidactic kind of character. That's the whole way that his world has, uh, his his creative world has been shaped, is is through his his own um, his own sense and sensibility. And it's um, it, it's really on a hiding to nothing uh, the the course that he embarks on with these various managers and. Um, the problem with uh, Mark and Van Morrison uh, uh, in that period is that he isn't going to fit into any of your managerial boxes. You know, it's, it's not only the infamous uh, Palladium show in, in, in New York. I mean, even at uh, something like um, the band's last waltz show, according to Harvey Goldsmith, his name is actually being announced over the PA system. Ladies and gentlemen, the one and only Van Morrison. And Van is standing on the side of the stage saying, don't want to do it, don't want to go on. And Harvey Goldsmith reckons that he actually had to kick him up the arse to push him out of the wings and onto the stage. So, uh, you know, there is this, again, it's this dichotomy. There's the, the, I think there's a genuine stage fright there in some ways. Uh, and yet there is also this absolute need to be out there uh, at the same time. That's, that's, that's the, the, the great dichotomy of a performance artist. And, and Van had it in spades. I found him paranoid to a degree. And he had this slightly cantankerous disposition, you know, it's a part of his nature. I think at some point in his life he was damaged. I don't know where he was da damaged or how, but I think he's put a protective shield around himself ever since that point in his life and said, right, the music business I do not like. You know? I'm in it, but I don't like it as a business. I like the music, I don't like the business. And so he's kind of put one lot in one department and one lot in another. I mean, you can write songs about anything, uh, but it's like uh, what comes harder is like sort of the projection on what it is um, and the fact that you know that it's going to be um, it's going to be criticised and it's going to be analysed and um, it's you know it's what does it mean and all this. I mean that uh, you know that makes it a chore because you know before you start that. Um, it's going into the marketplace and it's going to be uh, cut up and sped out, you know, and uh, that's not what it's about. Is that a burden yeah. to you then, the fact that your records are subjected to this sort of analysis and to this sort of criticism? Well, it's boring. You know, it's boring. I mean, it's, it's supposed to be spontaneous. And uh, if I knew what I was saying, um, then I'd, I'd say, you know, this is about this. But that's not what writing is to me, you know. Um, it's coming from the unconscious or collective unconscious or something, and I don't know what it means either, <laughs> you know? You know, there are external factors of business and media and your other responsibilities as an artist that Van Morrison spent a lot of, Van Morrison spent a lot of time complaining about. And that's fine. I mean, a lot of people don't enjoy that stuff. But somebody's got to do it. You either have to let your manager do it or you have to do it yourself. And if, you know, you're unwilling to do either of those things, you know, it's gonna it's gonna ruffle feathers even among people who kind of are getting paid to have your best interests at heart. But you can't not do it and then complain about not getting it. But Van Morrison would, <laughs> as, as an Irish guy once told me. He goes, you know, if you're sitting in a bar with Van, and uh, there's three guys, Van would buy every fifth round. 
And I felt like that was a really like kind of damning comment, you know, it's just, you know, you're kind of a little bit, una you know, you're not aware of what the kind of etiquette is for the people who are around you. And I think Van Morrison suffered from that. In the aftermath of the controversy at the New York Palladium in late 78, Van Morrison tried a different approach and hired Rolling Stone's PR man, Keith Oltham, to help manage his image. One of Oltham's first acts was to arrange a sympathetic interview with the melody makers Chris Welch, a move that he hoped would coax his client into taking a softer attitude towards the music press. I got a call to an audience with Van at the Inn on the Park Hotel. Anyway, he was in the coffee shop conspicuous by the fact that he was flaxing his teeth in the middle of the open area where everybody is sitting around him, which he continued to do while he was talking to me. A little off-putting, somebody got... <laughs> well, let me tell you what, I'm not, what I don't do. I don't do interviews, I hate interviews. Hate interviews, and I, and I don't like working with press, you know? And uh, I won't answer questions about my personal life. Oh, it's a good start, Van. Yeah, right, OK. When he talks about the Palladium event that had happened uh, a few weeks before, two or three weeks before, he said, well, that was one show out of about 29 shows I'd been doing, maybe more. And uh, they were all great. He said, I did the, the bottom line, and uh, that was fantastic. Nobody writes about that. They just wrote about the one show, the Palladium. When he did walk off stage, I said, well, what, what did you do? Why did you walk off stage? And uh, he said, well, uh, I've been on the road for weeks and weeks. I was totally exhausted and uh, I just had to get off and have a rest. So, you know, nothing more sinister than that. He said that, um, you know, people can damage your whole career with a story like that. He said, why do they pick on that one incident? Well, of course, that's newspapers, that's journalism. It is a story, unfortunately. Um, but he said, well, newspapers have too much power in that case. And, uh, he said that uh, that's one of the reasons he liked punk rock, because they were attacking the establishment, the music business, and uh, the perceived power that they had. He didn't like any of the photographs that existed at the present time. So I fixed a photo session with Brian Arras, who was a very good top-line photographer. He goes into the studio with Brian. He's got his sax with him. He's in a particularly disgruntled mood. Suddenly there's a clattering of tripods falling over and a lot of swearing. Van emerges after 10 minutes. I finished with all this fucking poison years ago. Oh, right. Well, you said you wanted good photos. This is one of the best photographers in London. You know? Well, I'm not posing. I don't know posing. Ah, I thought that was the idea. You know, portrait photographs tend to be posed, Van. Look, what I'm employing you for, and the finger comes out. We all like the finger, don't we? What I'm employing you for is to say no, no, no. I said, really? I said, have you considered the parrot? He said, what do you mean? I said, well, I don't do that, Van. I would offer advice. If you don't want to take my advice, it's entirely up to you. But I'm not just handling you on the negative. If you don't want to do anything, then you don't need me. And I have been paid up front. I'll think about it. I said, you do that, Van. And off he went. <laughs> I began to realise that Van Morrison, one of Van Morrison's things is to confrontation. He measures people by confrontation and how they react to him coming on in a semi-aggressive manner. It's the way he sorts the wheat from the chaff. And confrontation had always been part of the backdrop to Van Morrison's life. Having grown up in the turbulent political climate of Northern Ireland, Morrison had left Belfast in the late 60s as the sectarian conflict in the province erupted in violence. In 1979, though the troubles remained white hot, he announced that he would return to Belfast to play his first gigs in the city for 12 years. The tour, which also included dates in the Irish Republic, was part of Morrison's general reassessment of his life, a process in which his thoughts had turned towards leaving America and returning to the land of his birth. I think Van was very nervous when he first went back to Ireland because he'd left at the point where it was a very fractious period you know, in the history of Ireland and then the troubles and shootings and things were going on. And some people thought he'd deserted a sinking ship, and, you know, 
rightly or wrongly, and he knew that there was a bit of resentment in the air, so he didn't quite know how he was going to be how he was going to be received. You know, would he be received as a sort of conquering hero, become a huge star in America, or would he be regarded as the boy who who uh, left the burning deck, so to speak? Only time I ever felt I had any empathy with Van Morrison occurred when we were on the coach going to, to Belfast from Dublin. Stopped at the border and we were right out in the middle of farming land, agricultural kind of stuff, area. And the waitress came to take our order and I'm sitting opposite Van face to face a few feet away. I don't know how I drew that straw. I don't think anybody else wanted to sit with him. Uh, anyway, I'm sitting there with him and she comes to give the order and she had the broadest Irish accent you've ever heard of. I mean, real agricultural Irish. And I couldn't understand a word she was saying. And I didn't want to be impolite, so I was saying, oh, yeah, could you give me that again? And she said, and I could see Van getting twitching, starting to laugh, you know. And I'm saying, and, and that, I couldn't understand. Is it hot? <laughs> and, I, and it came again with this heavy broad I couldn't understand a word and he started crying with laughter and he started and then it started me we were both trying to suppress it because we didn't want to be rude to the waitress you know and it was the only time I've ever felt any rude and he, he, we were both hysterical with laughter by the end of it following the end of the tour Morrison returned to the Bay Area to record a new collection of songs that would move him away from the pop gloss of Wavelength and towards the themes that would dominate his work during the 80s. While working on Into the Music, he also began a new partnership with longtime James Brown collaborator Pee Wee Ellis. Ellis was unfamiliar with Van Morrison and his previous work, but accepted an invitation to become his new musical director. Somewhere between R&B and pop and folk, and fresh. It was fresh to me, which allowed me to uh, have a fresh look at it and have a, a new take on my concept. And it fit. It fit. It fit my personality. It had a nice bounce. It had a good rhythm, simplicity. The band was an amazing singer. They had a good band. And um, so it made a nice platform. It was obvious I respected his music. He respected my abilities. And we had a good working relationship. In, Into the Music is a classic record and was acclaimed as, as such at, at the time. It returns to some of his core themes. It references previous work. I mean, the very title, of course, echoes a song that appeared on the Moondance album. Um, and, uh, you know, he references Astral Weeks. We walk 
once again down the avenue and there's that uh, sort of string motif that, that, that also recalls Cypress Avenue. Um, so it's a, it's a self-referential work in a way. Um, and it's also very bright and upbeat with, um, you know, songs like Bright Side of the Road and uh, You Make Me Feel So Free. When the healing has uh, uh, the healing has begun and um, it's all in the game, you know what they're writing about. These are uh, good recordings, but they become improvisational uh, set pieces in his, his his live performances. What their purpose becomes is for him to develop his dynamic craft and his improvisational craft on stage. It's a stunning rebirth and a signal to what uh, is going to occur later. Um, I think it's recorded in America, but his, uh, his, his mind is very much on uh, returning to uh, both England and Ireland, I think. While Into the Music attracted universal praise, Van Morrison's next record proved to be one of the most divisive in his canon. That Britain was firmly in Morrison's mind was reflected in the thematic concerns of what would become Common One. The album was recorded in Europe, the band having decamped to Super Bear Studios near the French Riviera, a reputedly haunted complex built on the site of a former abbey. The selling was fantastic. You know, we uh, come, come from our room, have breakfast, and uh, go into the studio. And um, some of the people had weird dreams and like, it was kind of, uh, kind of black, you know? It was in the, up in the mountains and pretty desolate. And we had a lot of um, interesting Situations like a haunted lunch in peace. A man wanted something like an app horn. We didn't have an app horn. So I suggested, well, if Mark played a flugel horn, like a fourth higher, and slow the tape down, it would sound pretty much like an app horn. And he did. <laughs> so we worked out, out there in the studio and um, stuff like that. And one night we, we went to have coffee on a break. Uh, the drummer didn't come back up with us in time. It was anxious to, to record, so uh, it went hard and open was recorded without a drummer because he was still having coffee. <laughs> hard and hard and open. That was done on the spot. Without a rehearsal, uh, we didn't discuss it much. <laughs> we just started and I played flute on that. It was kind of a magical thing that happened there. Uh, very spiritual. Can you meet me on the country? I lost all time in England. Can you meet me? Can you meet me in the country? I lost all my time in England. Can you meet me? We go riding up the candles in the country on the summer time in England. Did you hear about? 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 Did
What's worth the cold Reggie? There was smoking up and killer. Can you meet me in long grass? In the summertime in England. The common one is an album where it really becomes overt. The degree to which Van Morrison is beginning to kind of identify with this Anglo-Celtic poetic tradition. You know, there's, you know, I mean, very um, overt references, you know, to Samuel Taylor Coleridge and William Wordsworth and lyrical ballads, their great, you know, collection of, of poems that kind of launched the romantic movement in poetry. Uh, you know, that connection, a kind of, um, a kind of, a sort of rock and roll or jazz or R&B pantheism begins to come into you know, into his music and which he sees those poets as kind of embodying, you know, that this life in nature. Common One is a work of genius. It's one of those rare albums, you know, I can think of half a dozen others, Miles Davis in a silent way, um, John Martin, Solid Air, Tim Buckley, Star Sailor, Talk Talk, Spirit of Eden, that just seems to come from another place and creates a new musical vocabulary. Um, it's not just ambitious, it's, it's, it's audacious. Uh, you've got these two towering pieces of work that I think are among the most beautiful pieces of music ever recorded in the history of pop music in uh, Summertime in England and uh, When Heart is Open. And yet in the middle of those two, you've got this, you know, piece of right on funk in Satisfied. Uh, and so this marriage of, and it's, it's actually there in Summertime in England as well. You know, I mean, famously, he's talking about Wordsworth and Coleridge and T.S. Eliot and William Blake. But then read the, the lyric booklet. Suddenly in the middle of that, he throws in Mahalia Jackson as well. Uh, and uh, so he's drawing on all of these sources of musical inspiration. Uh, you know, I mean, it's, it's, is it, it's got a folk influence. It's got a free jazz influence. You know, you can... You can hear kind of English hymnal influence. You, 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 there's a classical influence in there, you know, drawn from, from Delius's uh, On Hearing the First Cuckoo in Spring, Vaughan Williams. Uh, and they're all thrown in there to create this, this really extraordinary piece of work that is unlike, and it's not even like Astral Weeks, you know, it's, 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 it, 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 which is another of those albums that I put in that category that I, that I listed, but it's different again from Astral Weeks, and he'll never do anything like it again. And you turn to the one, and you turn inside for a while. And you turn to the one. Say, how many angels? stands as a, a, a towering achievement. And the fact that uh, it wasn't recognised as such at, at, at the time, I find quite extraordinary. Did I recognise it as such? I'd like to say that I did. Uh, I probably thought it was his best album since Astral Weeks. I think today I'd put it up there alongside Astral Weeks as you know one of the pinnacles of, of his long career. So you have to bring people along. You, know, you can't cater to everybody's little whim. You have to be uh, 
You know, trust your instinct enough to go ahead and bring people along at their own pace. Released in the summer of 1980, Common One received a series of damning reviews in the music press as critics struggled to comprehend Morrison's vision. However, in an era where glitzy, bombastic rock and pop would come to dominate the charts, the album prefaced a decade in which spirituality and a quest for musical transcendence would become Van Morrison's overriding concern. He followed Common One with 1982's Beautiful Vision, an album in which New Age ideas, in particular the work of the spiritualist Alice Bailey, became an explicit theme. Beautiful Vision represents kind of a high watermark, I think, of this, like, you know, kind of deeply romantic, you know, kind of spirituality, you know, that, that Van Morrison kind of, you know, plunged himself into, you know, this kind of idea of dweller on the threshold. I mean, I think, again, I, I think that's how he saw himself, you know, on the threshold of, of transcendence, on, you know, of, of moving into another world, you know, songs about angels and things like this. You know, there's a very Blakeian kind of quality, I think, to what Van Morrison was up to at this point. You know, the sense, you know, Blake was somebody who would describe conversing with angels, you know, uh, in a very, in a very ordinary way. And I think, I think Van Morrison was kind of experiencing himself in this regard. You know, there's something, I mean, it's a, it's a long tradition. I mean, it goes well beyond Blake, you know, I mean, there's, you know, uh, particularly this kind of like Irish Celtic, you know, sort of romanticism is, is something, you know, very, very deep. And, you know, he just, Van Morrison just immersed himself in it and, you know, created music out of it. All of the music that I had been playing had really been, I, I'd played, been playing a lot of jazz. And then I, I got, I got to, I started playing with Huey Lewis. And of course it was corporate, not really corporate rock. We were kind of into a new wavy kind of thing. That's how, kind of how we started out. So, but we're trying to make a success and, and you know, there was no spiritualism in any of the stuff that we were doing. Um, and so, yes, it was refreshing um, because it, it was, you know, the music is like, the lyrics are like poetry, you know, with Van. Van writes poetry, he writes great poetry. And, and, and the, the fact that it was all about this mysticism was uh, was refreshing because I was always kind of into that as as a as a teenager and and well I'm st and still to this day I mean I'm I'm sort of I'm a pretty spiritual guy so um, yeah at that time it seemed really refreshing to me that that it, this was happening and that you know that that he was doing a project like this and and it, it was a good thing it was nice it felt good it, working with Huey Lewis uh, in the news you know we were doing we do basics. And then we'd strip everything down and redo everything except for the drums. So, you know, that's the way we did it because you get better separation on everything and you can EQ stuff. And, but uh, Van was just, he got everybody in the room, the singers too, everybody. I mean, the whole thing. We're all set up in the room and, um, and, and it's, a, it's a one whole performance, and, um, which made, makes it very cool. It, 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 uh, there's magic in that. On the on the Well, Beautiful Vision is a more conventional record than Common One, but I mean, it's, it's a record full of, of poetry and soul uh, and, and driven by, by these twin muses, really, of, of the new woman in his, his, his life, um, Ulla Munch, um, and um, his, his uh, sort of theosophical inspiration and you know at times and this is something that you find in in Sufi poetry for example you know 
is he is he praising is 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 he talking about a, a spiritual love or a, a a secular love because they're both there on on this record Following the recording of Beautiful Vision, Van Morrison completed his move back to Britain, finally settling in London's Notting Hill. It coincided with the realignment in his career. The international fame and prominence that he enjoyed in the 60s and 70s now gave way to a quieter, more independent phase. Withdrawn from America, it was probably timely and appropriate because um, um, the America of the Reagan era was the America of the individual icon, this sort of great superannuated uh, star, Madonna, Springsteen, Jackson, Prince. They're individuals that have got all of the light and uh, pressure put on them, and that's not Van's world. I don't know if, if Van had stayed in America during the 80s, um, would, uh, would, would, would he have had such a, a decisive direction? Um, would he have had um, the, 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 the same uh, uh, degree of um, autonomy um, in, 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 his, in his work and his, his art? Van shapes a new identity in terms of that in, in the 80s. It's a singular presence, it's a singular voice, and it's a singular approach. In terms of references, he develops his, his own world all of the esoteric influences from the theosophists to Alice Bailey, the romantic poets, they're all impacting in some way on the songs that he's writing and on the performances that, that he's given. These esoteric influences and Van Morrison's new status as a niche artist were prominent features of a new studio album, 1983's Inarticulate Speech of the Heart. A clue to the trajectory of Morrison's theological interests was printed on the sleeve in the form of a dedication to L. Ron Hubbard, the founder of Scientology, while the musical context of the album and the inclusion of several instrumentals suggested that capturing the interest of the mainstream was no longer a concern. Indeed, although sales in the UK were strong, inarticulate speech of the heart failed to chart anywhere near the American Top 100, confirming that an artist who had once been a major commercial presence was now catering to a narrower audience. Inarticulate speech of the heart, I mean, just in its very title, expresses a kind of Van Morrison's, I think, musical desire at this point to sort of get, you know, really beyond words. And the degree to which, you know, instrumentals play a, you know, a, a strong role on that album, I think is another element of that. You know, that, that somehow, I mean, this is a very romantic notion that somehow words aren't enough, you know, that you can't capture in language you know, the nature of these kind of uh, transcendent experiences. But it wasn't the kind of music that fans who were responding to Van Morrison's hits were going to respond to. The record, I, as I recall, got reviewed well. You know, there was an element of, um, I, I mean, I think critics liking that, that kind of idea of the inarticulate speech of the heart and, and what he was striving for. You know, but that's not something that's going to get you on the radio, you know, and there's, you know, that sense of that divergence from his popular audience to, you know, a kind of niche, you know, prestige kind of audience and, uh, you know, appreciation. You know, I think that's, you know, this is around the time when that transition takes place. The first time I heard in a particular speech of the heart was a vocal, which Van had me singing with him. Just the, 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 the chorus. In a particular speech, in a particular speech of the heart. And then there was an instrumental, which Van played on the saxophone which I uh, started playing. It was my band. And uh, became a feature 
with a, a, a mind. The record I'd, I'd have the most reservations about is Inarticulate Speech of the Heart. Um, I think simply because it's the most 80s sounding of his records. I mean, the great thing about Van Morrison and, and you know, what makes him stand out for most of the 80s from, from other singer-songwriters, you know, including the, the very greatest, like Dylan and, and, and Neil Young. He doesn't get sucked into this 80s sound of, you know, drum machines and synths. This record, Inarticulate Speech of the Heart, is the closest he gets to that, that synth sound. He doesn't really have this kind of early middle age crisis that someone like Dylan has, because he's gone off on this quite different spiritual quest. Um, but this record is the closest he gets to what I regard as a, a horrible 80s sound. The release of Inarticulate Speech of the Heart was followed by a return to Belfast and four nights at the Grand Opera House that were recorded for a live album. Part of Van Morrison's core artistic identity had traditionally been his live shows, and during the early 80s they became a particularly important forum for exploring and adapting his music and for trailing new ideas. When I'm playing live jobs, right, and I'm in the middle of a tour, I don't think about writing songs, it's not part of my, my reality. So I'm just concentrating on that, you know. So you do actually compartmentalise things very much like that. You take care of business. Well, whenever you commit yourself to say, I'm doing so many dates here, right? So then when I commit myself to that, from the, from the time I say, yes, I'm doing that, until the time I finish, that's what I'm doing. So my total concentration is on doing that job. Whenever it finishes, the job's over. Then I can get back, to, you know. But until that point, I mean, I, there's very little else I can do except that, because I have to sort of wind myself up to do that, you see. Um, if I don't, I can't do it. So I have to focus my attention on doing that. And I can't really come out of that until I'm finished, you see? It's a matter of, you have to put yourself up at this energy level, right? Um, otherwise you couldn't do it. I couldn't get up on a stage if I didn't concentrate on getting up on a stage, so I couldn't do it. Do you find it harder to summon that energy level that you're talking about? Oh, yeah. yeah. It becomes progressively harder as time goes on. Yeah. <laughs> Then we play a, a place three days straight. You need to buy a ticket for all three days because you never know which which one you're gonna get. You know, well, if he gets bad when he's on, there's nothing like it. It's amazing. It's worth the price of all three tickets. His live performances in the 80s are extraordinary. It was a, a rapacious. I, I followed him all over the country. I spent three nights in Belfast at the Ulster Hall watching him. And um, yeah, the things he could, he could create magic. Uh, I mean, the, the root of musician and magician being quite similar. And, and yeah, he, he could do this. this the, whole, the whole dynamic um, interplay with the musicians that you can hear on, um, uh, don't uh, too late, it's too late to stop now and um, th that is is taken to a new height uh, particularly early 80s is, is interplay with um, uh, P.B. Ellis
quite a bit of improvisation what happened, yeah. It's extending things, changing the order of things. Uh, I'll come from a jazz background, tradition, and I very seldom play the same thing twice, except on tours of certain songs. There were solos that I played that I liked a lot, and I felt like they fit the music. I would play the same one every night. The band caught on to that, and sometimes he would hum part of it with me. <laughs> but by the mid-'80s, Van's association with Pee Wee Ellis had run its course. 1985's A Sense of Wonder proved to be his last record with Ellis employed as musical director. Reviews of the album had been largely tepid, and Morrison looked to move into the latter half of the decade with a new sound of direction. It was feeling like a time for a change. And uh, sometimes you have to do that, you know, shake things up. And, you know, which is fine with me. Uh, 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 things were getting to be a strain to come up with fresh stuff, uh, interesting stuff. Uh, I think Van was struggling. Um, it was just uh, time for a change. No before after, yes after before. By the time we get to a sense of wonder, all of these different elements are, are, are coming together in, in a very poetic and, and soulful way. Uh, you know, I mean, he's fusing or putting alongside each other settings of Blake, W.B. Yeats, at least, he would have if uh, the, 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 the estate hadn't initially blocked him from doing so. Alongside, you know, covers of Mose Allison and uh, 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 Ray Charles. Also alongside this kind of evocation of this dreamlike childhood. There are so many different facets of Van Morrison and this is a record in which they all come together, really. With A Sense of Wonder coming after a run of several albums in which he explored transcendental and metaphysical themes, it was clear that Morrison's spirituality now resembled something of a quest, one that ran throughout his work. I mean, it's like sometimes you get asked a question. I mean, uh, last year, I think somebody asked me a question about um, when did your songs start to become spiritual? <laughs> I mean, from like when I first started uh, my first album in Warner Brothers is the most spiritual, lyrically album I've ever done, probably. My second album was very spiritual. I mean, a song, Into the Mystic. Like, well, the question was, when did you get into mysticism? I mean, that was on my second album, Into the Mystic, and that's the most mystical song I've ever written. So, um, uh, you know, if maybe I'm part of my own tradition. I don't know at this point. You know, maybe I'm paying lip service to my own tradition, but I mean, um, you know, you get these kind of things and they seem really silly because if you were the guy, really, I mean, if they really, all I've got to do is listen to what I did 20 years ago. It's, it's, themes have always been there. It's always been the same themes. It's always been writing about the same things. It's, it's no, there's no, no different, right? So to me, it's not just this album. It's like all the albums I've done. I can't specifically get really, uh, feel any one way or other about this album. It's like, you just take a whole lot, it's all music. 
its lyrics and music and the whole smorgasbord. Um, all of that desire for transcendence is really about feeling entrapped, I think, in a, in a personality that's, that, that's not jibing well with the world around him and, would, and with many of the people around him. I think that, you know, that desire for transcendence is, is about a struggle that he feels all the time. If you're in pain, you take painkillers. Uh, you know, if you're in physical pain, you, 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 you might numb it with drugs or with alcohol. Uh, I, I think Van Morrison was in some kind of spiritual pain. I mean, he's, he's, he's never been noted as a happy bunny, as they say. Uh, and, you know, I think there was some, some psychological or spiritual pain, whatever you want to call it. And so he went looking to heal whatever that pain was. And if you're in pain, you will try anything and you will look everywhere. And so that's why I say, why shouldn't he turn to Scientology? Uh, why shouldn't he look at, uh, you know, a whole range of different religions and philosophies? And indeed, that's, that's what he does. Um, and what is fascinating is the journey rather than, or the questions that he's answering, asking, rather than the answers or, or where he subsequently arrives at. Because where he arrives, of course, is no guru, no method, no teacher. So he goes on this long journey and then ends up coming back to this simple truth that there are no external answers. The answer really lies within our own hearts. The seminal statement in this spiritual quest came in 1986 with No Guru, No Method, No Teacher. Recorded with a reconfigured band, the album attracted the best reviews of Van Morrison's 80s work, and for many it represented the culmination of the journey that he had begun with Common One. It's actually a statement of the position that he's arrived at. It's a quote from, from Krishnamurti, in fact, so paradoxically it's come from a guru. But it's this, this notion of um, having conducted this spiritual quest and not having found the complete answer anywhere and then coming back to this realisation that the answer is within your own heart all the time. Um, I mean, that's married to, uh, you know, well, musically, one of the finest records he's he's ever made. You know, when you listen to a track on uh, No Guru, No Method, No Teacher, like In the Garden, which is where that line comes from, you know, that there's a kind of pantheism that, you know, he puts forward there. You know, it's like you don't need the guru to take you to, you know, enlightenment. Really what you need to do is connect with the natural world around you. Again, it's a very romantic idea. And that's an idea I think that, uh, you know, that appeals to a lot of people. It certainly appeals to a lot of critics. And I think that's one of the reasons why um, the record was reviewed as well as it was. You know, it, it, I mean, you could look at no guru, no method, no teacher as, yeah, it's kind of free from ideology, but it also it's kind of free from a certain discipline also, you know, uh, it's a little easy. That said, In the Garden is a very beautiful song. And I think that, you know, Again, it's a place, one of those moments where Van Morrison does find, you know, that kind of thing that he's, I think, searching for always in his music, where you just kind of disappear into the sound. The fields are always wet with rain After a summer shower When I saw you standing Standing in the garden In the garden all misty wet with rain it's the key song, uh, as he would often talk about it taking you through the stages of a meditative ritual. And even now, when he does it live, it still is sprung with this um, sense of expectancy and 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 and, and awe. But in those uh, initial uh, performances of it, um, yeah, quite spellbound and spectacular. And actually, um, at a certain point, he could you became aware of um uh, kind of uh, a, a, a static religious people 
coming to the gigs and uh, and kind of getting uh, into a mystic Christian uh, vibe that was coming off that. Touch your cheek so lightly. You were born again, born again. You fell, you fell, you fell, you fell, you fell, you fell, again and again, and you fell, you fell, you fell from the garden. Yeah. By this time, Astral Weeks, which has been disregarded when it came out and didn't sell at all, by the mid-1980s, Astral Weeks has been recognised as this, this shibboleth, this, this iconic record. And of course, this track harks back to the sound of that. So point number one, uh, people are going to seize upon it for, for that reason. But it is also, um, you know, a profound statement that he's making in there as well. It's not a coincidence that this is the song which contains the line that gives the album its, 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 its title. This is, uh, if you like, the resolution of the search, the quest, the odyssey, the spiritual odyssey he's been on throughout the 1980s. Uh, so, it, you know, it does stand out as, as a, a seminal track, both musically and as a, 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 a personal manifesto, if you like. Despite the praise heaped on no guru, no method, no teacher, Van Morrison continued his by now familiar refrain that the music press was an unpleasant and parasitical phenomenon. The iconoclasm and intransigence that he had become known for only intensified with time, and he now dedicated himself to the project of consolidating his independence, dispensing with management altogether and insisting that he had nothing to do with the rock world, either artistically or commercially. The, the form structure that I'm working in is a traditional structure, you know, anyway. So I think the tendency is for like, um, you know, is, is people to, yeah, explore my own traditions, musical traditions, uh, genetic traditions, what have you. Yeah, I think that's, that's a key. That's Ooh. a key. Whereas, um, because there's, there's, uh, there's no mileage for me in, in what you call rock. I mean, it's, it's non-existent to me. It's not even my reality, so um, it never was. This whole uh, period in, in the 80s is, um, is really about defining his singularity, I think, and to remove himself from these genres and, uh, and uh, the places where he's thrived in the past. Uh, R and B, you know, he's done the folk, he's done jazz, and I think his 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 attitude is: I've done all this, I've worked through it, I've I've earned my position, I've taken the knocks, I've been through the divorce, I've been through the managers, I've 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 done all of these different things. If if he's made various sacrifices, and all he's got is his work, and his work's his own thing, and so I think he wants it to be recognised and accepted as something that is a part. It's probably the most alone persona that exists in, in contemporary songwriting. This is why we have album titles like Beautiful Vision. He's trying to hold on to this beautiful vision uh, in, in, in the light of, um, you know, a detestable media, uh, a venal recording industry. Um, and so he's trying to take as much control as he can of his own career and rely as little as possible on um, this, this sort of corrupting structure uh, as, 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 he, as he sees it. It's a constant battle and unfortunately it does begin to impact on his songwriting as well. He becomes quite bitter and there's nothing very appetising really about rich rock stars, um, you know, be bemoaning their fate. <laughs> Uh, and it, it would be better left, left, left out of the songwriting, but uh, probably very hard to do because this, this is impacting hugely on, on his life. 
Morrison rounded out a decade since his return in 1977 with the release of Poetic Champions Compose, the final album before a major stylistic departure that would come towards the close of the 80s. Originally conceived as an album of instrumentals, Poetic Champions was welcomed as another idiosyncratic album from a mature artist who was finally comfortable with his musical identity. When I started off, I thought I liked the whole sort of jazz instrumental album when I started. But when I did the th when I did three numbers, I thought, no, I don't want to do that. Changed my mind then. I thought, no, I'm not going to do that. So I started to bring in songs then because I wanted to sing then. I think I played enough. I want to sing now. So it, it went on from there. The songs seem to me to all have um, a unity of theme, though. Um, a sense of searching, a sense of trying to find, a sense of... Well, I mean, that just, that just seems that way, but, I mean, it's like you sort of... I mean, you know, you do what you do. I mean, uh, you know, um... You know, sort of Graham Greene writes books, that's what he does, you know? Um, I mean, when you sort of become a songwriter, then, then, then you, you write songs. Um, and, like, after about the second or third album, you realize, well, I mean, you know, I'm doing what I wanted to do you know, as I'm writing songs. By the fourth or fifth album, you're writing more songs. But when you, you, you write from the point of view that you are searching, but you're actually not. But in order to be able to write something, so it was like, a, you know, write a story or write a song, you have to pretend you are, because otherwise there's nothing to write about. Poetic Champions Compose is another wonderful record. and and. Uh, again, it, it kind of sums up so much of what he's been striving towards throughout the 1980s. Um, what strikes me, what stands out for me about this record is that by this time, he's developed this, this sort of argo of words, phrases, motifs that occur again and again, you know, I get look at the lyric sheet of, of the album, you know, and he's talking about um, the open heart, uh, what is real, what is true, rapture, music as healing. I want to know that you get the feeling. Did You Get Healed, that became um, a signature piece in the live context. And the whole idea, almost joking about the idea of what his performance is, you know, Did You Get Healed is sort of like referring to what effects has this had on you. The nature of his spirituality uh, was literary, you know, poetic, you know, musical, um, kind of erotic in a way. Where Van Morrison ended up at his best at that time, which is, you know, you can reach back to a blues classic, but you're not gonna do it in the just straight blues way. You're gonna filter it through all these other things that you're interested in and really come up with something new, something that feels fresh and highly individual and highly of that moment. You know, and I think, you know, that's where he got, you know, in some of those performances. Van Morrison followed Poetic Champions Compose by making a return to his roots, recording an album of folk songs with Irish traditional band The Chieftains. Other collaborations followed, including a duet with Cliff Richard and a lengthy association with the jazz pianist Georgie Fame. In 1990, The Best of Van Morrison was released, his first ever compilation album. 
It met with unanimous acclaim, swiftly going platinum and eventually becoming one of the best-selling records of the decade. Over the course of 10 years since a period of transition, Morrison had finally completed the journey from the questing and diffident 60s troubadour to a universally respected heritage act and assumed his place in the musical firmament of the modern era. He has a lot of respect from his fellow musicians and from the people who like his work. And I think he'd rather have that than adulation. He's not really interested in fan, fan appeal. You know, he's interested in his work being respected and received with dignified critical response. That's no one to the artist All oh, sound and stone and time There's a kind of coming of age story, I think, you know, for the music, uh, Van Morrison's music of this period. You know, there was a sense in which, you know, he became a very different artist from what he was when he started out. And, you know, he was a grown-up. You know, and that the person that he became was very clearly reflected in the music that he made. How he saw himself in a poetic tradition and in a musical tradition, uh, you know, all became very clear. Later, you know, I think he would explore different aspects of that and, you know, in a sense, go back around maybe to some of the stuff at the beginning of his career. But at this moment, I think you know, he found out who Van Morrison was, you know, in the way that everybody, you know, when you're in your 30s and 40s, that's essentially who you become. Part of that spiritual quest is, is a quest for self-discovery. And that, you know, I think it's, it's finally what he accomplished. Well, given the fact that I happen to like moon dance, um, I think his later period was more musical. More musical sophisticated, and, uh, identifiable structure, identifiable in terms of it sounds like Van. Van Morrison has gone through his different periods of uh, introspection, outgoing, musical success, flop albums occasionally, um, and I think what we have to do when you're appraising Van Morrison's work really is to think of him as an entity, as a total person. He has this fantastic voice, he has this tremendous, unusual personality in the sense that he's not a showman, like most people are in rock music. Um, you have to take him on his own merits, and uh, he never ever lets you down, really. Van Morrison is a true freewheeling spirit. For me, the overriding quality of Van Morrison's music throughout the 80s and throughout his whole career, actually, is his consistency. There will be ups and downs within that, but there's a consistency of following his art and his muse in a very single-minded way. Um, you know, I, I know in this, this pop industry, we love to sort of go through an artist's work and say, oh, this was the great comeback album and this was the nadir and so on. I just can't look at Van Morrison's work in that way at all. I just see a unified body of work, even though it is so diverse, you know, even though uh, it spans jazz, R&B, blues, folk, everything. To me, it is such a unified body of work, more so than the work of, of Neil Young, Leonard Cohen, Bob Dylan, who are other great singer-songwriters who, 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 whose work I love, but I think whose work is much more characterised by peaks and troughs. Um, for me, this is a consistent body of 
work of high caliber. The peaks are genius and the troughs are still bloody great. <laughs>